Hello and welcome again to RC Model Reviews. Today I'm looking at the Arcbird, this little circuit board here, and it's quite a full featured device. It's uh, basically multiple components. It's an OSD, which stands for on screen display. So if you're flying FPV and you've got your goggles on or you've got an LCD screen, this will display on that screen a whole lot of useful information, such as how high you are, how far you're how far you've traveled, how fast you're traveling, which direction you're heading in, and, and voltage of your batteries and so forth. So it's like a heads-up display. It gives you all that information which makes sure you don't outfly your batteries or go too far or go too high. Really, really handy when you're flying FPV, especially if you're going long distance FPV, because it'll tell you how far away you are. And because it'll tell you how much battery you got left, you can determine when you're going to turn around and come back without running out of juice. Very important. Um, so the on-screen display is quite a cool thing. Now it has also stabilization built into it. So when you put this in your model, it has little gyros in there. You can flick a switch, it goes into what they call a balance mode. And in the balance mode, if the, the aircraft is disturbed by turbulence, it will automatically output correcting signals to your servos, so it'll restore it to straight and level. Very handy if you're flying on a turbulent day, or you've got a model that's a bit of a handful to fly, and you just want to turn it into something that appears to be much more stable. The balance mode can be quite useful. I've, I don't often fly with balance mode, to be honest, but if you're trying to get steady video footage, you've got an onboard camera, and you want to get some steady footage, it can, be, it can make a big difference if you turn on the balance mode, the model doesn't get rocked around so much, so you, your camera footage is much smoother. It's not as good as a gimbaled, uh, gyro gimbaled camera mount, but it's still a really useful feature. Of course, it has returned to launch, and what that basically means is that this thing knows where you started from, and it can fly back there all by itself. And why would it do that? When would you do that? Well, there's a number of reasons. If you set up your failsafe on your RC gear correctly, then if you accidentally fly out of range or whatever, or there's interference that knocks out your, your receiver's ability to receive your transmitter signal, then the return to launch can be programmed to automatically kick in, turn your model around and fly it back to you. So hopefully it'll fly back into range. You can regain control and remember not to go that far in future. Also, if something goes wrong, if your radio gear fails, I mean, Perhaps your transmitter battery goes flat, perhaps something else happens so you can no longer control the model, then again, this, if it's hooked up to failsafe, can kick in, bring your model back safely, it'll circle until it runs out of battery and then it'll crash nearby so you don't have to walk so far to pick up the pieces. That's very handy. Saves a lot of legwork. And of course, the other use for RTL is if you've flown a long way away and you're getting tired, you can flick a switch and it'll fly back by itself. Circle around overhead, then you can flick back to manual control, land it safely. So RTL is really useful, but don't get carried away with the power of RTL because it can cause you some problems. I'm going to do another video in which I'm going to show people um, how not to use RTL and when RTL can actually go badly wrong and crash your model for you. That's very important if you're getting into this FPV and you're thinking, oh, return to launch, I'll never crash another model, never lose another model. Not true! It can actually make things a whole lot worse if you don't know what you're doing. Now, this system has another really cool feature, which I think is excellent, and it's called the fence mode. So, what that means is if you're flying in a, an area where you've got predefined boundaries that you're not supposed to go beyond, and a lot of clubs have this, you know, if you go to a club, you've got a club flying field, they've got permission from landowners to fly over the land, but you're not supposed to fly beyond certain limits because you'll be flying over someone else's land. Or you may be flying over a built up area or a school or housing or something like that where you don't really want to have your model flying because if it crashes, well, you can be in trouble. With this system, you can set up a series of boundaries, a rectangular boundary, and the model will stay within that boundary. If you fly into the boundary, it'll turn around and come back towards you. So it ensures you're not going to fly in a place you shouldn't be flying. Really quite a smart idea. For example, here I fly from a runway, an airfield. I don't want this to fly over the runway. So what I could do is set up a boundary and make sure it only flies in the area that is on the other side of the runway, and it will never come back and cross the runway where there could be an aircraft coming. So, hey, that's a pretty cool thing. Then just make sure if you're not on your toes, it'll protect you from making navigational errors. It also has some waypoints. So you can say, well, I want to go three kilometers that way, then two kilometers that way, and whatever. You can program the waypoints in there. It'll fly that course autonomous, autonomous by itself. <laughs> I hate that word. It'll fly it by itself. And so you don't even have to put any control inputs in. So in theory, you can fly way beyond the range of your radio gear by setting up waypoints. And then the final waypoint, of course, you'd want to bring it back close enough that you could take control back and land it. Simple as that. So yeah, a lot of power built into this little device, but has it been built well? Has it really going to live up to the claims they make for it? And will all these functions actually work? Now, that's what I'm going to set out to find out. First thing we'll do, I think, is have a look at the build quality. Let's have a look at what you're getting and how well it's put together. Okay, here is the main circuit board, and as you can see, there's actually two circuit boards here. They're held together with some um, 
0.1 inch connectors along the side so you can pull them apart if you need to. It's got a whole row of pins along here for plugging in your servos. There's obviously, you have six channels come in, four channels go out. Two of the channels are used to control certain functions such as turning on the OSD, or turning off the OSD and so forth, changing the balance mode and all that. On the other end, you've got a whole lot, this is for programming, I believe these connectors are for reprogramming. You can update the firmware. I'm using the original firmware because that's what came in it, but later on if we need, we'll update the firmware if there's an update available. Uh, here we plug in our video camera. This goes off to the camera, so you've got one lead takes the um, video in from the camera. It comes with a little connector that'll fit quite a number of the cameras out there. I think it probably fit the Sony 600 TV line with wide dynamic range, which is good. That provides the power and takes the video feed. And then this lead will go off to your video transmitter. If you have one with a matching connector, I'll have to make up a little connector because I don't have the ArcBird video transmitter. I'm going to use a little 5.8 transmitter. Uh, a 1 watt one, in fact. Can I test out that 1 watt, 1 watt transmitter that I had here before? This other spare wire is for audio. If you've got an audio feed, I don't have audio, so um, I'm not going to bother with that. Now, there's a current sensor here. The current sensor. Uh, one thing that irked me a little bit is they have one of these... Let's see the connector there, it has a little polarization thing, little thing, the plug that goes in there is supposed to have a little titty on it so that you can't put it in the wrong way around. But they give you a servo type connector, so you could in theory plug that in the wrong way around. And that could possibly blow up your ArcBird. Why are they not giving you the right connectors? Why do you have to use a servo lead? That's pretty bad. I would have expected that, you know, um, they could have forked out for the proper connector so that people couldn't blow their stuff up by plugging it in the wrong way. That's a, a demerit point for that. Um, comes with the GPS, of course, a little GPS, Samsung Gold Star GPS or G Star, I don't know, G Star. Anyway, it's got a little onboard battery to keep the Almanac up to date. Um, it comes with heat shrink, I suppose. I, I don't know. Do you put this? I mean, how are you going to mount that? It's just got the bare circuit on the back. If you sort of glue that on your model, you, you risk damaging the components on there. Because um, it has to go this way up. There's the patch antenna that it uses, so it has to mount that way. But there's no mounting provision. That's a bit sorry. It should have something on the back here so that you can actually Velcro it or mount it on your model without endangering the components on the back. That's a bit of a demerit. Now, it does have a heat shrink. I, I assume this heat shrink goes over the current sensor so that you don't have all these exposed wires here that could short out exposed contacts. Um, maybe it's supposed to go over this. I don't know. I'll have to check. The instructions, as, as usual, it doesn't come with instructions. It comes, you go online, download them. I've found, found several versions of the instructions. So yeah, none of them are that good, not that clear. And so, yeah, so when you're putting this in, you have to be very careful. Look at the labeling on the circuit board. Make sure you've got ground correct at this end. You've got it correct at this end as well, or you could damage the whole thing, which would really pee you off. Now, quality control, uh, build quality. Mm, I'm not really very impressed, to be totally honest. I mean, for a start, if we look at this connector here, see this one here, I'll get something to point with. Look at the corner of this connector here. I'll try, I'll bring it up to the camera, try and get it a bit closer. So perhaps hopefully it'll focus on this. There we go, look at that. There's a little plastic titty on the edge of this black um, pin header here, which is actually broken at the side of the white connector for the GPS. That, that little bit of flash there has caused this to be damaged when it's put together. So you can't actually plug in the GPS connector because that's impinging on the area. That's really bad. That's not good. That's rubbish. Another thing I noticed is comes with all these servo leads for connecting to your receiver, double uh, females, which is fine, that's good. But some of them are broken. Well, they're not fully broken. They've got bits out of them on, on where, the, where the wires have been pushed in. I don't know, I'll see if I can find one here. Um, here we go, see if we can focus on this. Now, focus, come on, focus camera. Come on, get with the program. Uh, there we go. Now see the one with the white wire, look at that. That's really bad quality control. It's been rammed in there and it's split the plastic. I mean, these are small things, but because they're small things, they don't take much to keep an eye on and to fix. The quality of soldering on this board is marginally, marginally okay. I'm not that impressed. Um, some of the stuff that's been added later, like this little set of dip switches here, it's been, looks like it's been hand soldered, not that well, uh, you know. And the programming, programming pins here are all bent over. They're on an angle. Because when it came, it came in one of these static bags here. No foam padding, nothing, just thrown in a box. So it probably bounced around in transit, bent those over. Ah, oh, you know, I mean, okay, it's, it's, a, it's not too expensive, but you still expect things to arrive in working condition and, and not with all these, you know, annoying little bits that are damaged or whatever. So, yeah, um, 
I don't know. Maybe it was just, I'm a bad, maybe I just got a bad one. Maybe I just, I always get the bad ones. Never mind. Anyway, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to wire this all up on the bench here and make sure it works before I go putting it in the plane. Nothing worse than spending hours installing stuff and finding it doesn't work. So it'll also give us a good chance to look at how this thing should be wired up and how exactly it works. So that's what I'll do now. So now you can see I've got it all set up on the workbench here. We've got the central unit here. We've got servos. I've hooked these servos up to my transmitter. So I've got aileron, elevator, and rudder. There we go. So basically at this stage, the commands from my transmitter are going through to the servos. Down here, we've got the OSD. Now I've left the lens cap on the camera. I'll take the lens cap off the camera so you can see it is actually putting video through as well. See that? There we go. There's my horrible grotty workshop at the moment. Put the lens cap back on, I'll leave it on because you can better see the black on white on the OSD in the LCD. Normally, of course, this signal going to the LCD would be going off to your video transmitter, and this is what you'd be seeing on the ground. Got a three cell LiPo, this runs on three cells. If you're gonna go four cells, if you've got four or five or six cells in your plane for powering your motor, then you have to have a separate battery to run the, the ArcBird, which is fair enough. Um, got a FreeSky receiver here hooked up using six channels from that. Got an ESC to drive the FreeSky receiver, and I've got the normal flight controls on the transmitter and I've also a noisy bloody planes and also I've got a set of switches hooked up to change the modes. Now when I change the modes you'll see the little icon perhaps I don't know if you can see it but there's a little icon in the um, OSD that changes to represent the mode we're flying in because there's all sorts of modes. Basically at the moment we're in a stabilized mode. No we're not. This is pass through. If I throw this switch now we're stabilized. You watch what happens. Assuming this is firmly mounted to the aircraft itself, if, uh, if the aircraft rolls, you'll notice the aileron servo moves in concert with that rolling. It's actually the opposite input. So if the plane banks to the left, it gives it right aileron to keep it steady. That's the balance mode, as they call it. It's automatic stabilization. Same goes for the elevator servo. If I introduce a pitch, you notice the elevator servo here is rocking backwards and forwards. Not quite as much as aileron, but certainly still moving. Then, of course, you've got your yaw on your rudder servo, but I noticed they've introduced some automatic mixing. When the aircraft yaws, not only the rudder, but also the aileron servos move. See that? They both move for a yaw, which I suppose, I don't know why they've done that, because one, why mix those two? Perhaps it's for aircraft that um, have a bit of, or don't have any roll coupling with the rudder. But even so, it'd be nice if it didn't put the roll in. I like to keep those things separate. Never mind. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it. You can configure the OSD using built-in menus and control inputs. I think if you hold the transmitter stick down for a certain period of time, six seconds, then the OSD will change. Hopefully, does it change? No, I don't know. Oh, I've got to have the switch. In. Yeah, the switch is in the right position. Um, has it changed? No, I had a bit of trouble with this, trying to get it to do its damn thing. Apparently, you have the switch in the right position, hold the stick over, full right or left for six seconds, and it should go into a mode that is a... Uh, a mode that lets you change parameters. I'll try it again with a different switch setting. No, it hasn't been doing it reliably for me. I don't know what's going on there. Oh, there we go. Yes, more than six seconds, eh? That's what it is. But now you see we've got a little menu here and we can change various parameters, enter the, the boundaries for our fence or our perimeter layout we've got, enter waypoint um, distances and bearings, all that sort of stuff. So. You can do it all through your goggles while you're at the field. You don't need any extra plug-in hardware, just your transmitter, something to display the signal, and away you go. Rather good, really. I kind of like it. It's, it's quite a nice system. So I don't know how we get out of that. What do we do? One of these switches has to work. Here we go. Back to normal. So now I'll put it in the ArcBird, but I wanted to get this little video up first to show you, yes, the... Sorry, I'll put it in the Penguin. I wanted to get this video up to show you, yes, I'm working on the ArcBird review, and this piece is an extra instalment in it, and soon we'll be doing the flight tests. And the flight tests, of course, will be conducted initially with the 2.4, because I know this is an absolutely solid, bulletproof, reliable system. So if there are any problems, it's down to this. But then, of course, we'll go to the R mile C, as some people think it's supposed to be called, R mile C um, UHF system, and we'll see how that works. But I want to test the return to launch with a known system before I start risking it to this little piece of kit. So the, uh, the, the FPV fun continues on RC Model Reviews. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. Give it two thumbs up. I think you can only do one. Um, comments on the bottom, uh, questions on the bottom, I'll do my best to answer them. And stay tuned for the next part of this review and part two of a whole lot of reviews that have already started coming up soon.